Okay, um, for our listeners and viewers today of the Silent Ego podcast, uh, Life Beyond the Spreadsheet, The Soul of the Entrepreneur, we have a very special guest today, um, Andy Gomesnell, international rugby player uh, for many years, um, now an entrepreneur. So we're going to explore Andy's background from uh, childhood um, to becoming a uh, renowned rugby player on the international stage for England and uh, now running the family business. So uh, he's definitely quali qualified as the silent ego, the soul in business, life beyond the spreadsheet. So here we go, Andy. Welcome. And today I'd like to talk a lot about you. Uh, so I'm going to ask a few questions and yeah, we're going to just have a little bit of fun for a few uh, for a few minutes. But uh, there's some common ground between us, Andy. Not only Sandbanks, um, where we uh, originally met in the uh, in the car park when you were down visiting, uh, I think you call it the in-laws somewhere along the lines. Um, and there's something else I always remember on that meeting, and it's never lost. It's that smile, Andy. You're always smiling. So I'm going to ask about the secret of smiling. Um, but also born in Durham, um, which is which is fantastic. That's kind of my hometown. Uh, um, many, many years ago, I left Durham town back in 87. But uh, there's obviously common ground there. So, Andy, it, it started in Durham as a, as a, as a little boy. Um, tell me the story. I mean, what, 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 why Durham and then down in the south? How, how did you end up being born in Durham? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, one for my father, it was purely around, hey, he was born in Ryslip, so you know, many, many miles away. Uh, it was all down to his work. Uh, and that was that was the uh, the fact of the time. And so um, I was born um, basically with the accent. Right, were you? <laughs> yeah. All right, okay. And I think it was probably, we moved further south to Donny, to Doncaster, um and that was where my first mini rugby club was right so that's where i was introduced to rugby uh but then we we uh, moved for uh personal reasons family wise and i ended up staying uh for some time um a couple of months with my grandparents and they had moved to uh, brackelsham bay in chichester hence why the whole sandbanks bit so from durham to you know basically the the, the sea and I just fell in love with uh, um, that, that view. Um, it's not the most special view, to be honest. Sandbox is a lot better, but it was, it was the seaside. Um, when you're a youngster, it, there's, there's no better place to be. And um, yeah, so I lost my accent within having, then going to the pri local primary school within two or three weeks wow. of dad sort of commut commuting in and out. He he just he just witnessed my accent gone because the kids couldn't converse and he didn't understand me and they were like who's this weird <laughs> child that speaks in a Why weird I? accent exactly <laughs> and I lost it it was gone and and I think one of the things that you know just uh, I mentioned to you dad had given me some uh, some old uh, cine video and you know there's no sound so you couldn't hear me uh, talking i think that's one thing that he he sort of regrets in the in the file system is that there isn't anything of me with the accent wow interesting yeah. Yeah. interesting how old were you then if you don't mind me asking so that was um about five or six so uh doncaster was under under sixes i was playing so i was five years old um so it was around that time so you know, six, seven years old, and then that was it. The uh, the accent's gone, and I became a southerner. All right, okay. <laughs> and then the the and the rugby started to kick in. Um, kind of. I think it, certainly the bug did. I mean, I I think you're you are massively influenced in all of these things by your parents, um, and certainly by my 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 father. The two options were my mum loved horses, so I did ride. I was a jockey, a show jumper as a young child. Uh, my mum wanted me to do it, so I kind of did, uh, and I loved it and I enjoyed it, and it taught me a lot of lot of le lessons. Um, and it, you, you know, as a young child getting on a horse is it's quite you have to have a lot of courage to do that, and then jump fences. And then on the other side, my dad's passion was rugby, loved it. He, you know, he played football, but something just kept coming back um, to him about rugby. And I think. I fell in love um, with the sport when dad set up a, a mini rugby club when, when we moved again 
he actually helped. There was three dads that set up Bista Mini Rugby Club. So it's now Bista Village, pretty much. All those fields were, were the rugby club. And um, we turned up on a Sunday and there was just no one there. And uh, so dad made some inquiries and there was no, you know, there was a, a, an amateur section, but there was an adult section, but there was no... Um, there was no juniors, there was no minis. So he sort of w set it up with two other dads. And um, I think starting something from scratch like that, you just saw what work went in. We were literally driving to training and seeing kids kicking a ball around in the street and just, you know, saying, come to, you know, literally down the road, come, come bring your boots and, and come and play. And it, you know, it grew and grew and grew. And then eventually now I think there's sort of 350, 400 kids every Sunday you know, going so wow. from zero. So I think that's sort of, you know, when that you're brought up with that, you, you, you just can't help but fall in love with, you yeah, know, with the sport and the game. Yeah. So you must have been, what, that'd be 41 years ago, am I right? You yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Taking on a little yeah, bit yeah, now, yeah, but know, uh, yeah. what a lovely story, a nice foundation. So it's sort of, quite entrepreneurial if you don't mind me saying you know your well, father exactly. in those days was sort of you know s spotting the talent possibly in you and you know pulling that together and then giving you that platform to flourish on which was the beginning of that journey into into rugby at what point did you start to pardon the language but you know that become not so much addictive but you've got a a sense that I'm enjoying this this is this is good you know I'm um, I'm developing and were you aware of that at the time or were you just out there having fun with that smile of yours running around just doing your thing? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I actually asked um, my dad, you know, since retirement and, and just sort of anecdotally sitting down and saying, you know, why do we do this? You know, how am I like this kind of asking those questions and, and I, I'm going through a similar period in my life now as a parent with my children and I think it sort of dawned on me when um, I played se as a young youngster. I played senior rugby, and I realised, wow, you know, the, the step up, the attitude, um, and it you know it wasn't a professional game, but I could see, you know, men's rugby versus where I was coming from. I was like, wow, there's a long way for me to go here, and I think that that sort of vision of where I needed to get to and the curiosity of how to do it um put me on my path to be just be better every single day you know and just um how do i get those skills and bearing on bearing in mind you know we're not talking about professional sport i mean the accessibility now is 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 phenomenal for you just have to google it don't you how do you do a spin pass um so you know i got that from the club and connections and contacts and meeting people you know, and asking the question, I was always asking the question. I wasn't afraid to ask the question. Um, and, and I've got it similarly with my daughters sort of seeing them starting to flourish. Now they're playing ladies hockey and they're only 14. And you can see the step up that they're achieving uh, right now. And it, it's a lot of similarities in that regard. But I remember asking my dad, you know, why am I like I am? How, you know, how am I? You know, how did you make me into this kind of beast? Uh, <laughs> and he sort of said, I, I don't know, you know, I, I don't really know. And I'm sort of trying to work it out so that I can be the best parent for my yeah. for my girls to uh, enable them to, to be, you know, just to have that attitude, a great attitude and a desire and um, curiosity. I think that's a great word in, in life is if you want something, you know, being curious is a fantastic uh, place to be to learn adapt and and grow I think you mentioned some key words there as well as the courage you know draw and and some people have to work quite hard at drawing down on the courage and the confidence to to kind of step into sport I always remember personally I mean very different level and you know amateur amateur standard in football but I can always remember it being you know eight nine years old and that sort of you actually Unfortunately, it wasn't my father. It was it was my best friend's brother that got me into a good, you know, a good league of football. And but I can remember my confidence catapulting when somebody told me I was good at something. So there was that word of encouragement from a total stranger that said, "You're pretty good at that, and you should continue doing it." And as a young child, you kind of 
or a young boy, you know, just, you know, skinny thing running around tackling and, and, and getting dirty on a Saturday morning and but starting to really enjoy it and like the the whole sort of, I suppose, how it made you feel. Yeah. You know, I, I technically probably wasn't very good, but, you know, it was that feeling of, I feel confident. And to be candid, I was a shy kid at school and probably, you know, a little bit timid. But that expression of confidence, and I'm sure you're seeing that, with the, with the girls yeah, now, yeah, totally. and um, you know, it brings me on to Fran, your your good wife. She always smiles as well. There <laughs> must be something in the water over at your place, but you're always smiling, you guys. So it's. Uh, it's I was a, known. It's, oh, the Aussies nicknamed me Smiler. Actually, did they? We, All right. we, we went on tour, and and uh, yeah, I I also said to to my my father, how did you know that I was any good and had the talent? And he said. There was this moment where all the kids looked to you and they passed you the ball to 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 and he said that's when I kind of knew you'd be you you'd be pretty good at this game. Um so that's quite interesting. Um but yeah, I I think um I think the feeling especially a team sport, mm. you know, I think it can be probably quite lonely unless you've got a big team behind you. You know, I'm I'm passionate about golf these days. I think golf is not one of the best games ever invented. Right. It's just unbelievable watched um Tyrrell Hatton win yesterday and yeah he's five years old his mother sent him a, a, a photo of him five behind the ropes watching um this Wentworth PGA UK championship right. and she sent this last day you know they play four days 18 holes the last day a massive pressure he's leading the tournament and she sends him that photo which I thought was really poignant for him it was just remember, go and have fun. You 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 were the kid behind the ropes. Now you're in the ropes. Go and have fun, enjoy it, thrive on it. You've deserved to get there with all your hard work. Just go and win the tournament. You know, just I just thought that was brilliant, and I, it was a load of parallels with, you know, what all the pressures in team sport and sport. But you know, that's an individual. Whereas the team sport confidence comes from helping, especially rugby union, because it's a it's a we always say it's a game for all shapes and sizes yes. backgrounds you know it doesn't matter where you're from mm. and every club i've been to has been inclusive and we all have we're all different shapes and sizes and different roles within the team and you know not every game you can get man of the match but every game you're needed and some games are suited to you to help mm. the team win mm. and i think that's the beauty of it if it's not perfect for you you've 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 contributed and you've made progress if you do get man of the match it's you know you feel um, you know a million dollars um, at what point did you feel that you were this was starting to turn into something that you obviously the confidence was there the kids were passing the ball you were you know you were starting to sort of flourish at, at, at your age and then at what point did it started to click and you started to get into club, you know, playing for clubs? And because you played for quite a number of clubs. I'm not quite sure. Was it yes. seven, seven yeah. clubs? Is I, that hold right? the, I hold the uh, premiership record. Do you really? Yeah. yeah two, 202 appearances, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So now I, I think the, the penny dropped when, you know, we chose the school. We all sat down and we had some options and I was very fortunate to, to um, you know, to at that generation you know, private education mm. and it had a history. Private schools had a big tradition and history with rugby. Mm. And, you know, so I was really, really fortunate. And we, we sat down. I remember my mum, my dad, myself, and there was three options. And we wrote on a piece of paper which school that we all thought. And to be honest with you, I thought my mum certainly would pick one school um, because it was local. And um she didn't we all chose the same school um and so when i went to that school um i saw the competition you know it's you know a lot bigger huge competition and i and i was young for my year so i you know i, I had to battle with this the kind of size element right. with rugby right um yes i played in the position where the little guy plays and the one that's has that uh, always been the case yeah, it's always been the case yeah i tried i went once went into a scrum and vowed never ever to go in there and that was mini <laughs> rugby it wasn't even a proper scrum right. i vowed i'm never going in there the dark arts it's right. not a nice place to be um and and but i remember being at the school and they were they were in a good way proactive with helping you achieve 
whatever goals you had, but make, making it progressive. So there were county trials and then there were divisional trials. And then if you were good enough, you'd go for England trials. And I remember getting into the county at young age, under 16s, under 15s, being a county player. But when I went to the next stage, you know, some of my peers were getting in and I wasn't. And I realized about, um, you know, that that kick when somebody says, you know, well done, you're a brilliant player, but actually you're not good enough for this next stage. That that was like, wow, OK. So you sort of dust yourself down um, and some people give up, some people stop and they keep trying and they keep failing uh, or you are positive with it and proactive with it. And I just remember uh, some of my best friends, you know, will, will testify to this. I just went on a mission of training myself. So whatever the weaknesses and negatives were, I was like, I'm going to make sure that the next time they see me, they're going to say, wow, he's improved. And that's one of his strengths. And so the next year I went for it and failed again and didn't get in. Uh, the next year, so 17 years old, didn't get in. I'd, I'd made the step up to divisional, but for England trials, you know, wasn't good enough. And then at 17, I failed again, couldn't get in. So I had one more year at sort of under 18s. Um, and uh, I remember the divisional trials. Uh, it was a place called uh, Ca Castle Croft in Wolverhampton, where we'd all go. Um, and, it, it, you know, it was a level of huge investment and professionalism, actually, when the game still wasn't professional, because this is in 92. <laughs> this is 1992. Yeah. Um, so the game only went pro in 95. So they, there was a real um, pathway even then. And I remember um, the the team was announced and for England. So I was in the trials and they made me captain. Wow. So, <laughs> so I was like... Oh, From zero to hero, yeah, so to speak. Well, so, yeah, I mean, I, that's when the hard bit starts. Yeah. So there's a sense of res massive responsibility at that point. Um, as well as you've achieved your goal and you've got in. Um, and that year, um, we had a good, you know, good team, good year group. Um, and the team had not won for the Grand Slam for, I can't remember how many years. It was some years, 11, 12 years in the schoolboy uh, records. And we were the first year to win it, the Grand Slam. So that gave me immense pride, but also just realised, you know, you can... You can do it and you well, can be successful. It's interesting pulling from that, Andy. The, it's in some respects, the story so far is that your father created an environment. You know, your parents had a real influence very early on in creating that environment. Both, you know, they, it's, I mean, they obviously, this was, this was not a deliberate plan. It was just, you know, you were in it. But how you've demonstrated that resilience, that relentless pursuit, it's like all things, isn't it? You see you on the pitch, you know, on the day and you've made it look easy. But the journey, the story behind the scenes is not easy, is it? But equally, how you build that resilience, that bulletproof confidence in your mind that if I keep trying and trying and trying, I'm going to get that break. That's the first thing. So, you know, so, so that mental conditioning, that confidence, um, but still, you know, you still weren't sure. And then all of a sudden you got the break and it started to move from there. And there's that next pillar goes in of courage, confidence, then you're now in a situation where you can, you know, you're developing the ability to play at a better level, but you're in the environment, but you're still earning your place. Because yeah. there's a fine line, isn't there, here coming, that you've got to stay on top to be picked fundamentally. Yeah. No, completely. I'll never forget the, 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 of that generation, the England team wore purple tracksuits. I mean, they're quite yeah, yeah. unique. I mean, full, you know, the real old school tight tracksuit bottoms with the, and the beautiful red rose and it's purple. I mean, they were extraordinary uh, colors. And when you saw you're playing the, 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 the school, you know, the other schools and somebody turned up, you could sense they, they were in a school, but they had a purple bottom tracksuit and you were like, they've got an England player. And I always remember, I want, I, you know, I want this purple tracksuit. Wow. And that year was World Cup year and uh, they changed the tracksuits. So I never, ever got, got a purple. purple. I never, ever got one. Yeah. They changed them to these World Cup shell suits. They were, they were horrific. Yeah. So I never actually got a purple. And when we were in the kit room at the end of my career, the kit man said, I've got a purple tracksuit in you. Do you want it? I went, no. I didn't get one. I didn't deserve, you know, to kind of, I didn't got deserve it. it. I got to earn it. I can't just be gifted it. Um, but no, I think, you know, going back, um, to your point, I think 
it's all very well getting there and I was known as a bit of a comeback kid as well um, and actually what the next learning for me was you know it's wonderful to have press write about you and it's you know you start to believe your own hype and and did I you know I did train really really hard but then suddenly you're going from schoolboy to adult and that is you're at the bottom of the rung and there are professionals even though still amateur but they they were so much more professional trained harder bigger physically we didn't have that that necessarily the education around fitness um you know nutrition all of those things and yeah you know, i still wanted to have fun as well so yeah. there was an element you you celebrate and you're enjoying yeah. this it's good old rugby moments. wasn't it yeah that exactly was the... drinking was a massive yeah. part of the culture and you know i sort of wanted to be the one of the best drinkers so you, you go and you, you try and drink with the forwards and that, that yeah. could always you know they, you gain respect but it can get you in trouble um and but i i then realized how difficult it was to stay there when especially you're you're not just competing at your year group suddenly that year group is out you know you're you go from under 18s colts under 21 students universities and then it's the big the big one you know it's everyone and i got they I'm, I'm happy to say mentally i wasn't ready for all of that i got i got bits of it wrong massively wrong and so you lose your place uh, you know i'll never forget you know we, we're all surrounded by technology and i remember learning i was dropped so I, I did get to into the england team early doors you know i university and i said i went to see the dean and i said look i can't take this this exam and they said why and i said because i'm playing rugby on saturday and they just looked at me and they were like that's ridiculous you know you can't just miss an exam for playing a, a game and I said yeah well it's at Cardiff Arms Park against Wales and I had to prove and show the letter that I'd been selected for England and you know happy memories um, but I I realized how competitive it was and I, I kind of lost you, you lose your way and you do lose your way and um, I learned after that six or five nations in that, that stage new coach comes in and I was I was dropped. I learned I was dropped on from the England squad on CFAX or Teletext, you know, and it was brutal, absolutely brutal. Wow. World caves in, um, you know, and that's not the biggest part. There are other parts that world caves in. But you you just go start again. And that but I realized that that's the process I really enjoyed. Really? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I sort of a bit of a junkie for, you know, and and. And what separates the great, great sportsmen and the great people is when they get to the top, they stay there and they stay there for a long time. So some of my stats in some regards are OK. They're good. Um, but in other ways, you know, the length of the period of time that, you know, I was playing for England, 1996 to 2008. You know, there are other players. There's a player just recently who got 100 caps for Australia, literally played yesterday. You know, that I should have I should have got to. I, I, you know, I never thought I was the best. I never, you know, I, I wanted to work as hard as I could to be the best. I felt I had a real niche and, and a strength in my game, which I, I forgot about and, and ran away from and, and tried to be better in other parts. Yeah. But I, I, I really applaud people that can do that and stay at that level. And I didn't, but actually, you know, I'm, I'm not, it's not, um, it's not a thing where I think, oh, I've, I've got regrets around that because I love the, I'm on the bottom. Here we go. I've got now this journey and this. Yeah, uh, give yeah. yourself a time frame. I'm going to get there. I'm so, going to prove everyone wrong. I yeah, love. I yeah. love that. Yeah. So sort of like that co resilient, competitive sort of mindset to sort of spring back at any point. It's also somebody saying no to you. I, right. I, I can't deal with that. I'm going to come on that, to that. Is, you I know, find that very, very difficult when somebody says, "Yeah, you know, no," and I'm like, "Why?" I, it's not an arrogance. It's not an arrogance. Yeah. I just, and yeah. I will take feedback on board and mm. you can't win them all. I mean, that's the biggest lesson in life yeah. is you cannot win everything. You can't win yeah. them all. But I hate the no bit. I really hate it. Right. Um, and I'm going to prove you wrong. Yeah, yeah. Good. Well, that's, 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 sort of, a bit, that's the, the journey I love. That's, that's the sort of the challenge that you kind of, pardon the language, got addicted to. Yeah, yeah no, the worst thing you can tell me is no, <laughs> yeah, right? Bring it because on. Because I'm coming back no yeah. matter how you look at it. Yeah. I mean, that's really good for our listeners today that that 
dogged resilience and you know but still seeking the pleasure in the game you know i love the game and you're not going to turn me off so with that in mind just quickly um would you have done anything different you know Sure. Uh, Would you have done anything yeah, different? I now you've retired from the big game, and yeah, of course, absolutely, one hundred percent. I don't think anyone's perfect, and I'm not stubborn enough to to just to say that. My wife would disagree, but I, I promise you, I'm not um, stubborn in that regard. So, I'm part of a group, um, and it's a charitable foundation for one particular club, which was my first senior club, which was Wasps, yeah. and I. I did mess that up, 100%. Um, I forgive myself because I I played um, straight in the col- uh, under 21s and then senior and whatever hap- whatever have ever happened happened. And um, there was one situation which I handled really poorly. I was um, young, and you know when somebody says no to you, I'm like, you can't. You can't say no. I'm trying to be the best for my team, for my club. And you're saying no to me? This is crazy. And I, I, I didn't respect it. I, I literally didn't respect it. So I went and did my own thing, which didn't help um, my um, feeling in the club. And, and so in the end, it came between, you know, renegotiation of a contract. It came between you know, a member of staff versus me as a player. And they chose the member of staff, which was the right thing to do for the club. So I literally was not offered a new contract. And I had spent six years there, come through the ranks, play for the club as an amateur to professional. And could I have handled that better? The answer is yes, because I did handle it better uh, later on. And it it enabled me to fulfill my further dream. Mm -hmm. So I learned that lesson. But, you know, it's not a regret because I went on the journey and I played for so many other wonderful clubs. But had you asked me at that period, do it differently, Andrew, had I got the advice, I would have done. And then I would have been a one club person. I didn't want to be, you know, I I feel that I'm massively loyal when I'm in, I'm in. And I did not... um, I didn't handle it well. And it's, you know, it's a fact of life. You, so it's one know. of those things, isn't it? I mean, but, you know, it's really nice to hear your stories, Andy, because I think you've been very authentically expressed about this journey. Um, but, you know, it was one thing coming along, the environment, you flourished, the hard knocks, the pushbacks. I wasn't always the number one guy, but I was always in there somewhere. And, um, you know, you did a good big job of it. But I'm dying to ask this question, so I've got to get it out. So you've played on the world stage, the World Cups, you know, all this real big stadium. What's it like? I've always wanted to know, what's it like in the changing room when you can hear that crowd roaring away and you're just getting ready to go out and do your thing? Yeah? Yeah. What's the feeling like? Well, it's the biggest adrenaline rush you'll ever experience. And, and, you know, I I do love... uh, those are you do miss so you love them but you miss them as well the adrenaline so you kind of go when you retire you go how am i ever going to have that feeling again so before the game is brilliant because it's all a build-up what i miss about sport is the tactics and the you're against 15 people who have got the similar uh, goals to you you want to win you want to have a tactic you want to you know make the opposite number not play well so that you're playing well but you know all there's so many different so i loved all the building of that all the week and i liked um coaches that would involve their players i wasn't very good at do this and you're thinking oh, that's I'm not sure we're going to win this game you know there's plenty of those coaches that go do this do this do this um and you'll see those players today still look up at the, you know, what do I do next? And I was never that player. It was, I had to feel the game. I had to understand the tactics that it made sense and then know that it's working. One thing I learned about myself was when it was working, we were winning. I got bored. So I got really? bored in a game and my standard slipped. So I kept getting substituted at 60 minutes working. Why? Why? It's because I was making mistakes. Because I was, and, and I didn't know why, but I was getting bored. So I, I then had to learn how to adapt my brain and trick my brain into evaluating every 10 minutes, basically going, hey, you, you know, you've just 
done a bad pass the next 10 passes have got to be absolutely world class and mint and then go again you, you've just done a bad box kick you know the next 10 box kicks have got to be on the, so i had and that enabled me to be sort of go to those perfection levels and yeah. and and play well so that was an interesting one for me as well so but nothing could be more boring than before the game the adrenaline you go into the change room so you're excited and nervous you just want to get on with it so that whole piece around um you know the coaches have come in reiterate and you're kind of like get on with it i i need to get in the huddle i need to go i need to get out on the pitch you know that you're just getting so nervous uh, so, you, you, so you're constantly kind of refining this all the time aren't you in this sort of like switched on mode yeah but you know, once again, that self-effacing thing. I knew when I was drifting off. But I mean, there's, you, I mean, you've got some lovely sort of um, things. Are, you know, the, the 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 magic kick, which was led to the um, Australia fi- the England final. Is that, that yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Way? You must have got that. Must have been like a trophy for you. If yeah, you that was have... good. I mean, there was a couple of things around that one. I mean, there's there's an incredible journey to be told around that, but. The feeling's exceptional, just going back to the feeling, see, running out onto the pitch, national anthems in front of your family. You can't get as big adrenaline rush as that. Um, I watched the hacker yesterday, the Australia hacker, and that was remarkable, stood in front of that. Uh, scary, but also just great to, to witness the history of the hacker and, and witness it. Um, and then you're in focus mode and, you know, the celebrations after or the, you know, the, the, the feeling after loss-wise. Um, yeah, those are amazing moments. And, you know, I I always sort of separate it. So they say, what was it like and what's it like now? And I go, well, 90, you are clapped in. 90,000 people clap you in and you've done nothing yet. Right? So they're adoring you. They're clapping you in. They're cheering you. I've done nothing. So I've now got this huge amount of pressure on that. You know, equally, you've got the adrenaline and off you go and you, you're delivering. I go into my boardroom now. There's definitely no one clapping me into a boardroom at the moment, <laughs> right? There's no, there's not ninety thousand yeah, yeah. adoring people. Yeah. Um, the, 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 there's just totally so different th- parallels. But just going back to the the kick. Yeah. So, you practice and practice and practice, and I've got so many anecdotes and stories around that. Um, but at the highest pressure, the moments you want it to happen and work, um, you know, those are split decisions, and then the skill set. That you have to perform on the money now i didn't get it right all of the time you know the, the the best perfectionist was johnny wilkinson around that his kicks and conditions that just impossible to get that ball through the sticks and he would do and his utter dedication and focus and i enjoyed you know playing with him and seeing uh his mentality around that it wasn't totally all for me because i like to laugh and a joke and i would go in and out of of that mindset um, but I respected, absolutely respected how once he was in, he was in. And that kick was, you know, it was reactionary as well. So we were under pressure. We were playing the host nation in semi final, and I could sense the f- initial contact. I'm like, I'm not enjoying this. You know, normally you, as a as a scrum half, you want the forward momentum. And I wasn't enjoying it to start with. They were really up for it. So I thought, look, I'm just going to, I heard one of um, my winger, Josh Lucy, I heard his communication. I just thought, do you know what? Best thing to do here is pop it over, put the pressure back on them. And anyway, I, I it's a, it, it, there's so many, and you know, anecdotal yeah, yeah, yeah. evidence split, on split that, that beautiful uh, kick contact, the, the drive, that beautiful, you haven't tried mm. hard. It was just perfection. Mm. Mm. I hit this thing so beautifully. And it and it's I knew it when it bounced. The roll was like, oh, I couldn't have hit that better. But I didn't realize how perfect it was going to be because it literally popped up as Josh got to the the guy who was about to a guy called Damien try. Poor him because it just popped in the air and Josh got it first and then just fell over him for the try. And that massively settled our nerves because that was five minutes and we were five nil up. Um, you know that settled the nerves and actually you know the belief went up as a team. So. All of that training, everything, that moment, you know, it was a great, great feeling, but still got a long way to go, 75 minutes. And it was, you know, it was pretty, pretty tight. But also the weekend before that, playing against a guy called George Gregan, who was that 100 cap um, legend player. Um, and what I learned from him was no matter what performance, and it was always a high standard by himself, but no matter what performance and what result, he stood there as a winner. He had the physical walk, strut, however you want to term it, that body language. He was always a winner. 
and his um the way he would describe before and after the game win lose was exactly the same it was as if he'd won the game and i was always in awe of that plus he was a, a hell of a player so to you know the, the that weekend i was playing against him and uh you know i i i had a good game um i got to him which i was pleased about in terms of um he was untouchable at times and you know being on top as a as a forward pack it helps it helps you so i'm thankful to those guys that but it was kind of when we won that game i was like you know from going from under 18s being captain and i've done it that that felt a moment as well because i'd lost mm -hmm. against australia many times made mistakes you know shoulder barge somebody just just being an it, idiot it, it's a theme and a penalty here. goes over we lose the game and it's my fault it's a theme it, isn't it andy it's yeah, sort it's of a like coming theme. back from making mistakes <laughs> yeah. you know i'm in the yeah. business of coming back from yeah. making mistakes and yeah and not just, being frightened i think courage, yeah. courage is not being frightened to make those mistakes well this is it isn't yeah. it failure is a good thing yeah. isn't it and the best men are made of it and i'd classify you obviously yeah. as a you know a, a hero of the that generation of rugby and um you know, some lovely stuff here, but just quickly before we move on to the, you're now an entrepreneur, you know, running um, N2S, which is the family business. But I just want to get this story kind of correct in my mind. It was the Gloucester signing. Um, There's a bit about the suit. Um, yeah. Can you just, for our listeners um, and, and viewers, just talk us through that? Because that's kind of quite, uh, quite funny, actually. Yeah, well... Um... I, one thing about uh, the England era, Clive Woodward, 2003, we were always well dressed. The, the grey suits when we won the World Cup, right. uh, we, we had great sponsors. So I, I remember signing for Gloucester and thought, I've got to be smart here and well dressed. And so I turned up in a suit and, and nobody at Gloucester had ever turned up in a suit in terms of a signing. So, um, you know, I was trying to portray utter professionalism. And anyway, um, it's still a rugby club full of um blokes that want to uh take the mickey and uh and uh and uh good pranksters and so i i had my kit on did the photo on the pitch and came back and there was no suit uh no car keys and no car um and uh i found my suit was um uh, uh, sellotaped to the um to the ceiling and it was of high ceiling so i could there was no way of me getting it um so that told me that i didn't get my dress code exactly right and then they parked my car in the local superstore somewhere around the corner. So I was about to ring the police and eventually everything uh, came to light. No, no, it's, it's our prank on you. Welcome to the club. So I knew I was in a, I was going to be in a good, uh, good banter, good, good club, good, you know, cause it, team sport and, uh, you know, I think culture is massive and same in business, those kind of culture make you feel at home all of those things make you thrive uh, you know culture is everything so i knew i was at the right club at that point so now you're you know obviously out of re rugby retired into now running the family business um and n2s so leading the forwards uh yeah. but in the business world so what was it like just quickly talk you know coming away from that professional um rugby status into fundamentally you know um running running a business just yeah well transition's not easy um yeah so it's deciding what to do and i was always inquisitive again uh, what am i going to do next um dad had kept me quite separate from the business i you know at university i would you know try and get some uh, some pocket money so i would go and work uh, with him and for him uh, and you know just laboring basically mm engineering and um so i got i got a view of what what it was he was doing but then i was so focused and he supported me but also he didn't want to talk about his work he wanted to, you know talk about rugby so that we had that bond together in, in that regard so he sort of kept me away from the business world specifically but he was trying to educate me in my career from what he learned in business so he was trying to make a probably an entrepreneur out of me um and so the transition you what am i going to do i mean this is the big question for every athlete but it, you know i'd align it to any walk of life you know whether you're a military it, they, these guys are going you know institution and then suddenly I'm making a decision to step out. What the hell am I going to do? And about, you know, working out your transferable skills and mm. and actually find a place that's going to be a happy home for you that you're going to thrive in because, you know, the the beauty about 
team sport, military background, is decision makers, not frightened, frightened to make a decision and not frightened to get on and just do it. And in sport, if you don't do that, you're going to fail, literally. It's, it, and, it's interesting, Andy, just interjecting there, that one of the big challenges that uh, I come across with uh, EgoStream, which is my business, um, with leadership is indecision, you know, decision dysfunction. And, you know, that becomes a bad habit in the end. And I think that sort of, you know, professional sport, self-reliance, making those decisions and then bringing that into the, you know, the transferable world and into business it must be. It must was, be quite interesting. It is. I was never going to be scared of it, you know, yeah. because you, when you're making these decisions as a leader in a business, and you haven't got ninety thousand people staring at you, mm. you haven't got that pressure. That is massive pressure, right. and you're asked to do that as a twenty-one-year-old with really no experience. Wow. You know, that is tough, and to have the um, courage to do that is is tick box straight away, right? So, I think there's a lot that business can. Um, thrive off with looking at their recruitment and yeah. you know especially you know sportsmen i mean it's an easy place for me to recruit if somebody's a sportsman and they you know in a decision making role i'm like okay you've cv forget you're you know you're kind of in because i get it um but so the transition was difficult and it's deciding what to do so i was intrigued straight away i what we were lucky with being pro athletes is your time rich mm -hmm. and that's something that i'm with a family and a business now i'm not time rich anymore so i was I, I sort of was lucky in my own head okay i've got a i've got a plan early uh, so i did plan and i used my time wisely did i use it effectively enough and, and enough probably not but at least i was doing it because mm -hmm. there's plenty of guys that didn't and literally got to that day and then went what am i going to do I planned five years in advance. Uh, I'd got a startup business that I invested in mm -hmm. um, and I was running. Um, so that was exciting for me because it gave me something else to think about other than my game on the Saturday. And actually the first lesson I learned was um, this pitch was in front of angel investors in the West Country. And I went down there and I was thinking, I have no idea. Right, I'm literally blagging this. I've got no idea what the hell I'm talking about. It's embryonic. We're creating an application. I'm like, this is 13, 14 years ago. Application. I mean, seriously, I'm a thick rugby player. And so I'm stood up there and you're messaging about what it is that we're going to create. I was nervous as hell. Wow. And then we created a, a board. And so I, the people that invested were really experienced and so i just sat in this board me five of us in this boardroom and i'm just listening and learning from these guys but then i'd go back to the rugby club and i would think we've got a long way to go yeah you know, these guys are serious entrepreneurs experience it's their own money they've put in we're talking millions of pounds that they've put in and when they're on it it's like a lawyer when they go into zone i was like we need to go up a gear again you know just in terms of our meetings and so I was at Quinn's at that time and um, I noticed some things at Quinn's that I just didn't like. I mean, guys would turn up unprepared, late, um, you know, just not focused. And I was like, there needs to be a bit of a shake up here. This is crazy. And tactics just weren't clear. You know, it was just, I was like, wow. So I really loved that parallel of actually using my learning in business suddenly from these great entrepreneurs and experienced businessmen and taking it into rugby and it it sort of matured me actually uh, in a lot of way because i was you know wanting to have a bit of a laugh with something i was like i can't be that person um so that was brilliant experience but what i learned was you've got to once you once you're giving everything and you're invested you're truly invested the people that you're with you just basics of um the values and the respect and i've from some of the actions that were happening and how people were behaving, I didn't like it at all. So I eventually told the, the then chairman and sort of said, look, I, I'm not happy. And he agreed with me, by the way. So I was like, wow, okay. I was sort of shocked that I was the first one to kind of bring it forward. Mm. Um, and at, like all startups, you know, mm. most of them do fail and this one failed. Mm. And I was doing a bit of consultancy work with my dad and, you know, a very fortunate first, sort of meeting that I brought my dad into we won a contract and he was like right that's it you're in 
Okay. Hey, well, he was like, well, I was well, like, hang on, hang on. I'm not sure I want to do this. No, you're doing it. Right, you're okay. In. You know, I like this. Once again, there's an adversity thing there, isn't there? <laughs> so there's a little connection there. Yeah. And you pitch up with your dad to do a deal and bingo, the lights go yeah, on. Yeah. So you, for, our, for our audience what um, and viewers today, what, what is, does NT2S do? What, 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 what's the business about? So we can just expand. Yeah. So, I mean, we're in the world of reverse logistics. So, right. you know, in the world of technology as well. So everyone's focused on getting new technology out. Mm -hmm. People tend to be very slow and thinking about what are we going to do with our old stuff? So that's our world is reverse logistics um, and repurposing, reusing, reselling, but also recycling. So uh, Jack, my father, built the business around recycling. And actually what I love about the business is it's very competitive. It's very difficult. We're very niche in the technology that we want to uh, recycle. So recyclers do millions of tons and the e-waste problem is gaining traction year on year 50 million tons we throw away basically it's ridiculous it's so so vast legislation is improving and changing it was set in 2007 you know we're in 2020 legislation for 2021 is changing so that's exciting but the way we've done it has been harmful for the environment a we put stuff in landfill not great um and for recycling purposes and refining critical raw materials that we dig out the ground a we're running out of it's this whole circular economy sustainability um you know we're running out of this stuff right so how are we going to make these devices in the future if we're running out it's crazy right so um it's a brilliant place to be it's almost we're 20 plus years old and we're still a startup because right. you know the 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 problem is getting bigger so actually the opportunity is getting larger and we're a small part of it very niche but we found a way to um do this in the most environmental you know embodied carbon the best message that that i think is so topical at the moment we found a way so we're at the start of that journey um so it's exciting you know again it's it's been difficult to, so it's been a decade now i've been in the business and i thought i'd have mastered it in five years sold and you know off i go to the next thing and and it's yeah you learn in business it takes so much longer you're enjoying uh, it longer. i do i do i'm passionate about it and i care about it so i'm lucky in that regard but i've made it that journey as well i've made um you know inquisitive again curio curiosity why are we continuing to do this thing when it's harmful to our environment and but okay don't criticize it or ask those questions without having a solution mm. what i'm proud of my my father jack is that he's found a solution and now for it's up to me to kind of promote that and get it to its next stage of scaling mm. um, because it is a global problem mm. um, and one major um, manufacturer vendor i mean they're on the, the, you know the name mm -hmm. sort of said love it we're not ready for you you know, well, let's talk next year. Mm -hmm. it's, it wasn't a no, mm -hmm. but it was still got me going, oh, my God, this is so frustrating. So, yeah, right. So I'm it's not just you're passionate and it's great and it's rolling on. I'm frustrated as well because I want this journey to, to happen now. Well, you, you and, can see sense, can't you? And, you know, the last thing anybody can do to Andy Gomesall is <laughs> give him the no, <laughs> right? Because that's like red rag to the bull, yeah, isn't it? You I know, you it kind is. of... It is. How do we overcome this? How do we master this? You know, you've got to realize my background, what I've come from, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I'm I'm now in business. So uh, I'm not going away. I'm yeah. getting ready. And if you want to be tackled, mate, then you're yeah. going to get tackled. Yeah. You know? And, I'll, I'll, <laughs> and, and it, you know, the nice thing is, is the my my past, you know, what was difficult in that transition was catching up because, right. you know, luckily I'd be in a meeting like this and we'd, they'd be talking acronyms and, yeah. you know, you know, the, the future of technology and i'd be like i have no idea what you're talking about so i'd go home i'd be writing all these notes out and i'd just be googling what does this mean what is this you know i had no idea same in into a, a degree you know i studied economics and didn't do very well at, at a level you know it was a, i had lessons in business to learn which was brilliant for you know dad always said this is going to be your greatest lesson you know being and running a business is going to be a great and he's right he's absolutely right um but yeah, so I, I, I'm just that that journey and that energy well, it, and that. Well, that's I, right. So if you parallel it with your sort of early stage rugby career, 
where it was the school of hard knocks. You were coming through, coming through. I think there's a there is a glean here of the best yet to come, Andy. Yeah, with NCS, totally, yeah, I'm going to yeah. take it to yeah, the no, world stage. And by the way, school of hard knocks. Yeah, is a charity. I'm a, a right. patron. So oh, are you really? You know, okay. No well, for, for our light. listeners, we'll yeah. have to look out yeah, for that. Look one. out, the school of hard knocks, incredible charity. Yeah, which um, I was I was a founding trustee of. Uh, and it, you know, so that, there's another journey for you. But um, yeah, I, I think um, when you when you're on something that you know is right, and it's you know you just you can't stop. Mm. You've got to, and and so I'm already thinking once you get this sorted, it's kind of what next and what other things yeah. are going on. But for this, this takes everything. You you have to give everything, and I think that's the that's the challenge. And I always used to wonder why some people would say in meetings oh you know do you still play rugby i'm thinking i've been retired five ten years are you crazy and no i don't play anymore and they say oh, is this your full time you know they were thinking i was doing other things and i was supplementary you know i was co-commentator and you know i would do charity work but they were questioning you know are you doing this for life? i'm like absolutely this is when you're all in it's a poker term when you're all in you're all in and I think that's a fair point. I think that it, it, it's come right through the core of this uh, this conversation and this podcast. It's it's fascinating, this all-in, dedicated, committed, overcoming objections, rejection after rejection, but making it happen, not sort of just settling for sort of, well, I'll see about that. You know, I'll be back another day knocking on the door. And I think that's important. But just coming back to the business, the, I mean, what was the economic times we're in right now and this pandemic and everything and corporations, you know, kind of losing their office and home working. This must be now a very good opportunity for you. Yeah, it's a great opportunity, but it's it's difficult to get to the people right. that are decision makers, finding the right people. Because we're covering sustainability, environmentals, mm -hmm. but also just the technology, you know, how people uh, are productive and using it. And now the context around pretty much you have two offices. One, you're not allowed to go to, you know, whatever your corporate um, yeah. business the environment. Uh, yeah. yeah, whatever their decision making is to, to with, with the pandemic. But pretty much I think what's people have realized in business now is that you can have two offices you can have three if you want if you're that flash but you can have two offices one is at home and now learning how to get your best uh, productivity i've seen various comments around I, i'm much more time mm -hmm. i i don't have to commute as much mm -hmm. therefore i'm getting more hours in so i'm much more productive versus that missing the connections with people that face-to-face, -face, um, reactive, interesting part to the the business um, productivity. They're missing that bit, so they're feeling a bit lonely and a bit low on that. And no matter how many times we converse on the wonderful platforms that are out there, it's not the same. It is not the same. But they've got now the, the, the context of what am I doing with an office? So we're still waiting on those decisions. Some of our customers, they've decided just go and get our IT and get it to people's homes. So we are doing that. So it's a relocation. But for me, I think the investment from um, business now in technology will be twofold. And there's different connotations around GDPR and you know, how you use those um, yeah. bits of IT around not just the techn technology part, but around the safety and the cleanliness and the, you know, the pandemic. Um, it's around that. It's, it's complex and it takes time. So it's going to be busy for us. I know that. And, and also, by the way, not enough. There's so much demand for product. There's not enough of it. it. Can't be manufactured quick enough. And there's too much supply because people don't want to get rid of stuff because they want to. They're worried about. So there's so much supply. That's right. You're in a good go-to position, and I think it's a case of pardon the language here, but timing your run. Yeah, completely um, right. Really yeah. timing your run because completely the change over the last six months. Businesses, corporations, obviously, which you serve um, technically and commercially, are be just getting round to these sort of adjustments. You know, what do we do? Um, and it's it's there in the priority somewhere. So we can only see that once again, the best is, you know, yet to come, which is fantastic. Yeah, no, but, but for me, the, it's the agenda. Yeah. So don't just leave it, um, you know, as a museum for the future. Do something positive with it. And some of the customer um, metrics we provide around environmentals and sustainability 
is gaining traction for the employees. They're realizing this is a company we want to work for. And my future, um, my children's generation, they will care about this. They won't go and work for somebody if they don't show a sustainability mm -hmm. agenda and actually show what they're doing. And it's, you know, it's not just around technology. Technology is good for sustainability. It's also a, a heavy user of, of energy. And doing that sustainably and having the right technology for my future uh, children's generation, you know, it's, 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 you've, got to, you've got to have it. It's got to be part of it. And a board member yeah. for especially private uh, and especially public businesses, board members need that. Somebody needs to be responsible for it. Somebody needs to drive the agenda and do the right thing for, by, by our planet and environment. Well, I think what's coming from, you know, without going into too much detail, I think uh, you are definitely in the right place. I mean, the, the alpha generation, which is our children and the, the glass, they're calling it the glass generation. So it's all predicated around technology and old to new and the reconditioning and making it friendly. Let's call it friendly technology. You're, you're right in the sweet spot. So, you know, you're about to, you know, hopefully hit that sort of uh, A grade again and and play it out as an entrepreneur, Andy. I think it's been fascinating today talking about your life and the journey. Um, we've all, you know, seen you um, on the TV from time to time. It was great to meet you face to face, that magic smile, yeah. that relentless pursuit. And the worst thing you can say is no to, to Andy <laughs> Gomesol. So all of you businessmen out there, um, if you want to wind him up, just keep telling him no, but he's not going to go away, I'm afraid. It's very um, true. But... Uh, Andy, it's been an absolute pleasure learning about your background. Um, let's stay close. And for all our listeners, um, hope you've enjoyed today. And we look forward to seeing you again at some point uh, on uh, Silent Ego, The Soul of Business, Life Beyond the Spreadsheet.